Welcome to Mayor Brown's Global Financial Markets Podcast. Each 30-minute episode is designed to help listeners better understand the legal issues that impact their business given the ongoing uncertainties in the financial markets worldwide. Speakers from across Mayor Brown's practices and offices provide their timely insights on a wide range of topics, including finance, financial services and insurance regulatory developments, securitizations and litigation in the United States, the United Kingdom, Europe and Asia. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, listeners. Our topic today is CFPB update, constitutional crisis or business as usual. We'll be focusing on the Fifth Circuit's recent ruling that the CFPB's funding structure is unconstitutional and its implications, as well as the agency's policy enforcement and supervisory activities over the past several months. My name is Ori Lev. I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of our Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Group. My co-presenters today are Chris Leach, a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of the Litigation and Dispute Resolution Group, and Krista Beaker, an associate in our D.C. office and a member of the Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Group. So probably the biggest CFPB news over the last few months is the CFPB is the uh, Fifth Circuit decision holding that the agency is unconstitutionally funded. While the ruling came in a case challenging the CFPB's payday lending rule, its rationale would apply to any challenge to any CFPB action. And if it's upheld in appeal, which we'll get to in a moment, that would mean the end of the CFPB as we know it. As I mentioned, the case involved a challenge to the Bureau's payday lending rule by an industry trade group. And in what can only be a cruel irony for the agency, the Fifth Circuit actually upheld the substantive validity of the rule against a number of challenges, uh, only to strike it down and neuter the agency because of how Congress set up its funding structure. The payday rule was based on the CFPB's statutory authority to promulgate rules to identify certain conduct as unfair, deceptive, or abusive, that is, as UDAPs, and it identified certain payment collection practices as both unfair and abusive. And the plaintiffs challenged that determination, but the Fifth Circuit held that the CFPB had properly supported its finding that the conduct met the statutory definition of unfairness, and it also rejected a broader challenge to the CFPB's UDAP rulemaking authority in general. And both of those holdings should prove helpful to the agency if the agency survives the constitutional challenge. But the big news, of course, was that the court held that the agency's funding structure is unconstitutional. The Constitution provides, quote, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, end quote. And the purpose of that clause is to separate the power of the purse, that is the power to dispense public funds, from the power of the sword, which is the power to exercise executive authority. And the Fifth Circuit opinion spends several days explaining the history and um, rationale of the appropriations clause. Now, like some other financial regulators, the CFPB doesn't get its funding through annual congressional appropriation bills. Instead, the agency, which is technically a part of the Federal Reserve System, is authorized to draw down funds equal to uh, up to 12 percent of the Federal Reserve's total operating expenses each year, and it keeps the funds it's drawn down. Even if it doesn't use them, it gets to keep them and roll them over from year to year. Uh, And importantly, the Fed itself isn't funded by congressional congressional appropriations, but instead uh, earns interest on securities and levies assessments on on certain banks. And the CFPB, I'm sorry, the Fifth Circuit found that this double insulation from congressional appropriation, where the CFPB gets unappropriated funds from another agency that itself is outside the appropriations process, um, was relevant to the appropriations clause analysis and served to distinguish the CFPB from other agencies that rely on non-appropriated funding. Um, and the court also focused on the fact that the CFPB gets to keep the money that it draws down from w- in one year. It gets to keep it into the next, unlike the Federal Reserve, which has to send its surplus back to the Treasury each year. The CFPB has already asked the Supreme Court to review this case, uh, noting in its cert petition that, quote, there are, quote, enormous legal and practical consequences to the decision. Uh, And the CFPB goes on to say that in the weeks that followed the decision, defendants in several CFPB enforcement cases have already brought similar dismissal um, actions and uh, have sought relief based on the decision, and that new challenges to the Bureau's rules and other actions can be expected to multiply in the weeks and months to come. 
The plaintiffs have indicated that they're also going to seek uh, Supreme Court review and ask the court to reverse some of some or all of the Fifth Circuit's holdings that um, upheld the payday rule on, on the merits. Right now, the plaintiff's cert petition and its opposition to the Bureau's petition is due January 13th. Um, the CFPB has asked the Supreme Court to hear the case this term so that a decision can come down by the end of June, and we expect the Supreme Court to honor that request. So what happens next? Um, we think that regardless of how the CF, how the Supreme Court rules, the CFPB is likely to be around in some form. If the Supreme Court reverses the Fifth Circuit's constitutional holding or vacates it because it uh, decides to invalidate the payday lending rule on some other grounds, then nothing changes and the agency continues to operate as it has been. If the Supreme Court agrees that the agency's funding is unconstitutional, then things will get interesting. Presumably, Congress will step in to fix the problem by changing the agency's funding structure, but it then might make some other changes to the CFPB's powers and authority in the process. But it's hard to imagine that the Supreme Court would rule that the agency is unconstitutionally funded and then Congress doing nothing. That would just be too disruptive to the economy um, and likely wouldn't be a result supported by many in, in industry as well. And so perhaps in light of that, the agency has continued to operate, bringing and settling enforcement actions and taking uh, uh, other actions as well. So for now, it's largely business as usual, with more to come in January or February when we'll know if and when the Supreme Court will hear the case, and then probably in June when we expect a Supreme Court decision. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to talk about uh, some of the agency's other recent activity. Thanks, Ori. And that's totally right, what you said at the very end. Now, despite all the legal issues that the CFPB is having with respect to its right to exist, um, the CFPB's work is continuing. And what I'm going to talk about here is just a subset of what it's been focused on. Obviously, the agency has a lot of enforcement and guidance activities going on, but one theme that's been persistent at the end of this year uh, that is similar to what was going on early in the year is their focus on junk fees. <clears throat> now, our listeners may recall that earlier this year in January, uh, the Bureau launched an initiative to, and I'm quoting the Bureau here, save Americans billions in junk fees. Um, and as part of that, the Bureau issued a request for information seeking information from the public on a variety of fee-related practices. Uh, from financial um, institutions, and this involves uh, things like overdraft fees, late fees, among many others that were at issue. Now, as I said, the, the, the focus on junk fees is continued both in enforcement matters and in informal guidance issued by the Bureau. And I'm going to start first with enforcement actions. Um, the first action uh, was actually a settled case against a uh, a bank in connection with uh, overdraft fees, and this was announced on September 28th. Now, according to the according to the case, uh, the bank's practices involved so-called authorized positive overdraft fees. Now, if folks aren't familiar with that term, uh, according to complaint, um, this uh, this practice involves uh, the bank allowing a customer uh, to purchase an item. Uh, if at the time of the purchase, the customer had a positive balance um, in the relevant account, checking account, saving account, what have you. But but according to the complaint, uh, the company uh, did not assess fees at, based on the balance at the time of the transaction, but rather uh, assessed fees at the time that the transaction was settled through back office functions, which varied depending on the type of transaction here, um, ATM transactions would be settled at the end of the day, and for debit card purchases at retail merchants, et cetera, that would be one to three days later. And so whatever a customer uh, thought was the uh, the balance of their account when they made the purchase might not be the case when that actually settled. Uh, in addition to, to these practices, the uh, the complaint alleges that the bank actually had documents, including focus groups, indicating that customers were confused by these overdraft fee practices and that customers would make affirmative attempts to avoid these overdraft fees by, for example, looking at their account balances immediately prior to engaging in a transaction, but were then only to be hit with that type of fee uh, later when they checked their account a couple days later. 
Um, now, in addition to these practices, the FT, the CFPB lays out a number uh, of times in which federal banking regulators, including the CFPB and the Federal Reserve, had warned financial institutions of, of their view, the, the regulators' view, that these positive uh, authorized, these authorized positive overdraft fees uh, were unfair deceptive practices in violation of the relevant statutes. Now, turning to this because there's a complaint, uh, turning to the allegations, uh, the Bureau alleged that this was an unfair practice uh, and an abusive practice, both in violation of the CFPA. Notably, there wasn't any uh, allegations of deceptive practices, which is uh, just interesting from a, uh, a side of agency practice. The consent order, because obviously this is a settled case, um, included uh, con uh, conduct provisions that barred the bank from making uh, authorized positive overdraft fees and uh, issued, a, issued monetary penalties as well, $50 million in civil penalties and at least $141 million in restitution. I say at least because uh, it seems that the, according to the order, they were required to uh, refund their customers' purchases. And at the time of the complaint, it seems that they had estimated that practice to amount to $141 million in consumer injury. Now, the next enforcement action uh, involving junk fees came out less than a month later, on October 18th, uh, and this was an enforcement action against a, a payment platform uh, that allowed customers to sign up for various third-party services. Um, according to the complaint, um, and I say a complaint, there was no consent order. This was a litigation filed without a resolution uh, in federal court. According to the complaint, uh, this company, quote, duped customers into signing up for 30 day trials of their subscription services in connection with whenever they uh, signed up to purchase this other third party service. Um, and this 30 day trial would automatically then enroll customers in an annual subscription if they didn't cancel prior to the end of the 30 days. Now, the Bureau in its complaint and its uh, press releases characterized this case as a dark pattern case and dark pattern uh, referring to deceptive practices that uh, regulators are talking about these days that don't really deal with the uh, core aspects of a product, but try and manipulate uh, consumers intent to purchase or other decision making practices. Um, they characterize this as a dark pattern case because the mechanism used to obtain uh, customer consent. The mechanism used to obtain consumer consent, uh, a click box at the end of the purchase um, that customers apparently thought was necessary to complete the transaction. By clicking that box, customers had actually agreed to enroll in this free trial and then uh, through an automatic subscription, an annual subscription. According to the complaint, uh, the company had actually tested this mechanism uh, and declined using a uh, clearer language that would have uh, more readily alerted customers uh, to the nature of the program they were subscribing to, uh, but didn't do so uh, to increase the rate of clicking on that button. Uh, so it, right now, they allege that this resulted in $300 million in customer injury, but uh, right now the case has stayed pending resolution of the uh, Fifth Circuit appeal that Ori just, not the Fifth Circuit appeal, but the Supreme Court proceedings in connection with the, the case Ori just talked about. Now, just the last item on my list is not an enforcement matter, but rather uh, guidance issued by the agency regarding two different uh, types of junk fees. Now, the, the first that was issued is now familiar authorized positive junk fees, uh, issuing uh, a document saying that these type of junk fees in the Bureau's view likely constitute uh, unfair, deceptive or abusive practices against customers. The second uh, guidance involves what the CFPB calls surprise depositor fees, which to you and me are really just bounce check fees, but viewed from the end of the person actually depositing the check uh, at the bank. Now, according to the compliance bulletin, uh, this practice is potentially an unfair practice, and the Bureau says it's largely because the customer cannot reasonably avoid uh, whether the check that they come to have in their hands uh, and deposit will ultimately bounce. Now, that's all for me on uh, junk fees in the Bureau. Obviously, this is going to be an area to look out for given the Bureau's continued uh, focus on junk fees in this, in this area. But now I want to turn to Krista for a uh, so an update on consumer reporting practices. Thanks, Chris. 
So over the last several months, the CFPB has continued to be active in the consumer reporting space. Among other things, the Bureau has issued a circular and advisory opinion, entered into consent orders, and released supervisory findings addressing a wide range of topics related to consumer reporting and the Fair Credit Re Reporting Act. And I'll discuss some of these releases. First, the Bureau's fall 2022 edition of supervisory highlights includes a number of findings related to consumer reporting. And interestingly, the CAPB emphasizes that many of these findings are repeat findings. That means that the Bureau is continuing to identify the same type of violations in its exams, even though past editions of supervisory highlights have called out those same violations. I'll summarize a couple of these findings. So some findings relate to the accuracy of information furnished. Among other things, the FCRA prohibits furnishers from furnishing any information if they have reasonable cause to believe that the information is inaccurate. And according to the CFPB, examiners are continuing to find that furnishers violated the FCRA by inaccurately reporting information despite actual knowledge of the errors. So specifically, the CFPB found that some auto loan furnishers furnished information to CRAs that didn't accurately reflect the information in their own account servicing systems. As an example, the report stated that furnishers reported consumers as delinquent, even though the furnisher's systems of records indicated that the account was in deferment during the time period for which it was reported delinquent. And I'll discuss this further, but reporting information that's inconsistent with some other information that the furnisher or the CFPB the, or the CRA has access to is a theme of the CFPB's recent focus on accuracy in consumer reporting. Next, the CFPB stated that it's continuing to find that furnishers are violating the FCRA because they are reporting inaccurate dates of first delinquency. So the FCRA identifies categories of information that cannot be included in a consumer report after a certain amount of time has passed. The idea is that at a certain point, consumers should be able to kind of move on from a delinquency and rebuild their credit history. And the date of first delinquency is important because it sets the date for calculating the start of that time period that once passed precludes certain negative information from being reported. And according to this edition of supervisory highlights, some debt collection furnishers reported inaccurate dates of first delinquency to CRAs in connection with utility accounts. And the CFPB explained that utilities are typically delinquent for a number of months before the accounts are transferred to collections. And so that means if a debt collector sees that the data for delinquency is listed as only a short period of time before they receive the account, that should be a clue that the data for delinquency may not be accurate. So examiners found that reasonable procedures would have prevented a furnisher from reporting a data for delinquency that preceded the account going to collections by only a short period of time, some things such as less than 40 days. Next, in October, the CFPB, CFPB released an advisory opinion about the reporting of what it termed facially false information. Facially false information is conceptually similar to those supervisory findings I just discussed that related to reporting information that's inconsistent with some other information that was in the furnisher's possession. The Bureau's advisory opinion focuses on consumer reporting agencies, not furnishers, and states that because consumer reporting agencies collect and assemble consumer reports and have just a lot of information about consumers, they're in a unique position to be able to identify certain you know, clear and obvious inaccuracies and then implement policies, procedures, and practices to keep those inaccuracies off consumer reports. The advisory opinion gives a number of examples of the types of facially false information that the Bureau thinks CRA should be able to catch, including an account whose status is paid in full and listed as having a balance due. So it wouldn't make sense for an account to still have a balance due if it was actually paid in full. Another example is an account opening date that predates the consumer's birth date. We might also see in the, this in the background screening context if a report included, for example, a murder conviction before the person was born. So there are a number of ways that CRAs may be able to identify inconsistent information or facially inaccurate information. So CRAs are required to follow, quote, reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy of reported information. And the Bureau said that it, it is issuing this advisory opinion to point out that the requirement to follow reasonable procedures includes procedures to identify and eliminate this facially false information from consumer reports. 
Next, in July, the CAPB issued a circular that addresses consumer reports. As you may know, if a consumer disputes information on their consumer report, CRAs and furnishers are required to comply with certain provisions in the FCRA to investigate the dispute. The circular states that the Bureau thinks some CRAs and furnishers have tried to evade their dispute obligations by requiring consumers to submit particular information or documents or to complete a proprietary form before they'll investigate the dispute, even if the consumer provided sufficient information to investigate the dispute. The circular also reminded CRAs that the FCRA requires that they provide furnishers with, quote, all relevant information regarding the dispute that the CRA receives from the consumer. According to the Bureau, CRAs often ingest dispute information from consumers using automated systems and then share that information with furnishers electronically. And when the CRAs share the information, they don't always pass along documents consumers provided to the CRA. And the CFPB said that, you know, while CRAs don't necessarily need to provide original copies of documents consumers submit, it might be difficult for a CRA to prove that it complied with that FICRA obligation to provide all the relevant information if the CRA doesn't at least provide electronic images of these items to the furnisher. So as an example, if the consumer provided a bank statement as evidence that they had never been late on a payment, the CRA likely should send a copy of that bank statement to the furnisher instead of simply telling the furnisher that the consumer disputed their payment history. Finally, the CAPB is also focused on consumer reporting and enforcement actions. The CAPB entered into several consent orders over the last few months that involve consumer reporting allegations, and one of those consent orders primarily focused on consumer reporting. In this action, the CAPB alleged that an auto loan furnisher furnished consumer report information to CRAs that contained a whole host of systemic errors, and that it knew about those errors for years before it attempted to fix them. According to the CFPB, this conduct violated various provisions of FICRA and its implementing regulation, Regulation B. The CFPB also alleged that the company engaged in unfair conduct by using ineffective manual processes and systems containing known logic errors to furnish information. And under the terms of the consent order, the company is required to pay $13.2 million in consumer redress and a $6 million civil money penalty to the Bureau. So it's clear from all of this activity that the chauffeur led CFPB cares about consumer reporting and is paying attention to a wide variety of consumer reporting activities. So entities subject to FICA requirements should expect scrutiny. And now I'll turn it over to Ori to discuss the Bureau's 1033 rulemaking. Thanks, Krista. Um, uh, so we're back in October, shortly after the Fifth Circuit decision, the CFPB took the first formal step of issuing long-awaited rules under Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act. And that's a section of the law that requires covered financial institutions to provide consumers with information about their accounts and transactions uh, with the financial institution at a consumer's request. Um, and while the law talks about a consumer's right to obtain information, the rulemaking is really geared as much to allowing consumers to share information with third parties who might offer uh, the consumer additional products or services. And it's also the provision of the law that's intended to further spur the move past what's uh, been referred to as screen scraping, where consumers give third parties um, their password and username so that that party can can log in in the consumer's stead to pull uh, to pull consumer transaction information. Um, of course, the law passed in, in 2010, that's a long time ago, but it provides that that provision isn't effective until the CFPB issues a rule to implement it. And that's why the CFPB's October action was so important. Um, and that action was issuing an outline of uh, what, what, what the CFPB is contemplating for this rule and soliciting input from small businesses as it's required to do uh, under the law. And the outline provides for a couple things. First, it, it talks about what kind of accounts the rule would apply to, um, which are generally asset accounts, think savings, checking accounts, um, as well as credit card accounts. Um, and the CFPB notes that this would also apply to institutions that apply, provide digital wallets or payment services connected to such accounts, even if the institution doesn't hold the account itself. Um, the outline talks a little bit about uh, what would be required to obtain a consumer's information, um, the kind of disclosure a consumer would have to get 
the fact that consumers would have to provide informed express consent uh, to the release of their information and a certification that would have to be provided to consumers um, that third parties will abide by certain obligations in handling the consumer's data. But the core of the rule, or, or the outline, sorry, um, and of the contemplated rule are the provisions that govern what kind of data the rule would apply to and how to provide access to that information. Uh, and in terms of the kind of data, the CFPB outlines six categories of data that it's contemplating would be covered by the rulemaking. Um, some are more straightforward than others. So the first category is periodic statement information for settled transactions and deposits. So, you know, the kind of things a consumer would already get on a monthly statement. Uh, the second is information about prior transactions that haven't settled yet. Um, so think pending transactions and the CFPB points out that many financial institutions already make that kind of information available in their uh, online account access portals, but that would be covered here. Then we get to um, some other information. Uh, the third category is something that is not typically provided to consumers, and that is certain payment information like the intermediary banks through which payments were transited um, and the account number and the bank of a recipient bank for a consumer payment. And the CFPB posits that providing that kind of information might be helpful to consumers if they're seeking to recover funds from a fraudster or a fraudster's bank. Um, but they also recognize that obviously that raises some privacy risks and, and seek input on, on whether that should be included. Um, the fourth category of information is uh, what the CFPB refers to as near future transactions. Think your uh, bill pay that you've set up online about future payments that, that, that have been authorized. Then there's some account identity information um, in a, in a catch-all category called other that uh, includes credit reports the financial institution has obtained and used on a consumer. And then the outline talks about how that how access can be obtained. And, and for there's sort of two kinds of access. There's direct consumer access where consumers getting his or her own information. And there the proposal under consideration just provides that um, institutions would have to allow consumers to export that information in both human and machine readable formats. And then most importantly and interestingly is how, uh, how third parties can access consumer information on behalf of consumers. Um, the CFPB is not a fan of consumers sharing their login credentials with such third parties for obvious reasons, um, you know, security reasons. And the proposal um, that the CFPB is considering would require covered data providers to establish and maintain a third party access portal where third parties could access consumer information with permission that doesn't require um, the third parties to possess or retain consumer credentials. Um, so I think that's that. That's the uh, th those are the big things. The rule also um, talks about limitations on what third parties can do with consumer information. That basically boils down to limiting uh, third parties' collection, use, and retention of consumer information to that which is reasonably necessary to provide the product or service that the consumer has requested. Uh, according to Director Chopra, the CFPB intends to publish a report on the it, input it receives um, on this outline in the first quarter of 2023 and issue a proposed rule later in 2023 with a final rule to be issued in 2024. So we expect more developments on this front uh, next year if the Bureau is able to stick to its timetable. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Krista to talk about um, uh, one of the CFPB's fair lending actions over the past few months. Thanks, Ori. So fair lending remains a priority of the CFPB. In July, the CFPB and the Department of Justice filed a complaint and a proposed consent order to resolve an investigation into a regional non-bank mortgage lender related to alleged redlining of majority minority neighborhoods. The complaint alleged violations of the Fair Housing Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and Regulation B, and the Consumer Financial Protection Act. The action is notable because it marks the first time that a federal regulator has settled public right lending actions against a non-bank mortgage lender. And state agencies were involved in the settlement, and that's atypical for red lending actions, which historically have been handled only by federal agencies. Importantly, the statistical allegations in the complaint indicate that the CFPB and the DOJ are not just going after lenders at the bottom of the pack. 
Instead, they're looking for lenders to be getting closer and closer and closer to peer parity. The other issues discussed in the complaint are similar to what we've seen in other actions, like if plate discussed office locations, marketing efforts, loan officer diversity, and discriminatory email. To settle the allegations, among other things, the company agreed to pay a $4 million civil money penalty and to invest over $18 million in a loan subsidy program to increase the credit extended in majority minority areas. And now I'll turn it to Chris to discuss the CFPB's digital marketing guidance and its buy now, pay later report. Great. Thanks so much, Krista. Uh, I'm going to have very quick items on both of those topics. So the first item I'll, I'll discuss is the buy now, pay later report. For our listeners who haven't been following, uh, late 2021, the CFPB began a mar- uh, market monitoring investigation into the buy now, pay later industry, uh, sending uh, civil investigative demands to the largest buy now, pay later uh, companies in order ostensibly to study the market. Um, And in the fall of this year, uh, the agency came out with its report on this topic. Um, We, our our firm put out a legal update on this, so I'm not gonna get into detail about what the ins and outs of the report, but for those of you who have not read the report, I would highly recommend it. It provides a relatively thorough overview of at least the Bureau's understanding of the structure of the market and potential future of where some of the market actors are going based on their review of those documents. The report then also concludes with an overview of some areas in which the CFPB uh, appears to believe that there could be some room for legal risk in that area involving uh, things related to electronic funds transfers, among other things. Uh, There's not been uh, further action in that space, but given the focus on uh, the buy now, pay later industry by the CFPB, and then also I'll note uh, by the the FTC in a a release that came right after the buy now, pay later report came out, um, I would would imagine there's going to be continued focus on that industry as it grows in importance uh, in the economy. The last action I want to highlight very briefly is uh, a an interpretive rule release that the bureau came out with um, this summer uh, involving digital marketers. So, according to the release, um, it was the bureau came to the view that digital marketers um, might be uh, what's known as service providers under the rule, i.e., uh, entities that could be the subject of enforcement actions or other uh, bureau activity um, if their marketing goes, and this is a quote goes beyond traditional advertising. And uh, just for context, uh, the general theory is that uh, somebody who puts an ad in a newspaper is not going to be subject uh, as an advertiser, as a service provider in here, but in the CFPB's view, um, digital many digital marketers are going beyond uh, merely just placing an ad in like a publication, but rather shaping the message either affirmatively in terms of uh, shaping the text of the ads and how it looks, but also shaping who receives the advertisements uh, via targeted advertising. Um, At this point, it's it's too early to see sort of where the agency is going to take that um, based on the statements by Commissioner Chopra at the time. It seems that one of the focuses there involves fair lending, i.e. having digital marketers target ads uh, to groups that might sort of overlap with uh, where if you sort of map that onto protected classifications might end up resulting, for example, a a disparate impact discrimination case. But like I said, this is at this point uh, still too early to say where they are. But this, I think, is an interesting um, extension of authority that the Bureau is taking here. And I think we should folks in that space should uh, just should be aware because that could be uh, a new focus uh, for the agency. And with that, we'll give it to Ori to conclude. Thanks, Chris. Uh, And thank you to our audience for listening today. Listeners, if you have any questions about today's podcast or anything else related to the CFPB, please email us at gfm at mayorbrown.com. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this program. You can subscribe on all major podcasting platforms. 
To learn about other Mayor Brown audio programming, visit mayorbrown.com slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.